Hello and welcome to Talking Europe. I'm Armand Georgian at the European Parliament in Brussels. A refoundation of Europe, that's the goal the French president has set for the European elections of May 2019. In the run-up to that vote, he's hoping to replicate at the European level the face-to-face -face meetings and consultations with French citizens that were key to the success of Macron's Republic on the move in last year's French elections. But building the same kind of enthusiasm across the EU will be an enormous challenge, and there is no Republic on the Move group here in the European Parliament. Nonetheless, Macron kicked off the consultation process in Strasbourg on April the 17th. Among the aims, making the EU more relevant and tangible to the everyday lives of its 500 million inhabitants. To discuss how realistic that goal is, I'm joined by Julio Winkler, a Christian Democrat from Romania. Hello to you. Thank you. Welcome also to Ernest Urtasun, a Spanish member of the Group of the Greens. Hello. Hello. And, of course, a familiar face to anyone who's seen this program a lot, Joe Leinen, a German MEP from the Group of Socialists and Democrats. Welcome back to you, Joe. Hi. Um, Joe, you are actually going to take part in these citizens' consultations. Why and what's the point of doing this? No, we urgently have to reconnect Europe to the citizens. Uh, we have to have platforms of dialogue, of questioning, of criticizing. And the election campaign three weeks before the date is not enough. So I think this year, 2018, is perfectly chosen to get a wider audience, to ask them what you want from Europe, what you criticize, and where should we go? And the citizens are the sovereigns, so yeah. we should... But how do you get pe people to even turn up? I mean, if someone isn't very enthusiastic, how does that process even begin to physically get them somewhere to a town hall meeting or whatever? Yeah, you have to have an attractive uh, uh, program uh, to tell them, look, you could influence uh, European politics. Uh, we will uh, get your questions and answers on board. They are not for the waste bin, but uh, it will be documented, it will be analysed, and uh, political forces should draw conclusions from that. Um, Ernest, you, you're not taking part, I gather, in the citizens' cons consultations. Why not? Well, I think all forms of uh, innovative participations are welcome, that's clear. But I also, I mean, we need to be frank, the ultimate aim of President Macron is to lead a new political force in, uh, in, in, in Europe, a new pro-European liberal uh, platform in Europe, which is not my political project. So I think I'm very much in favour of, uh, of promoting uh, uh, new tools of participation for citizens in Europe. And I will be doing that myself. My political family, the Greens, will be doing that myself also. And I here agree totally with, with, uh, with Joe, not only in the elections, but we have to do that uh, uh, before. Uh, so all innovative uh, proposals are welcome, but also uh, I would say that we need that to do uh, in all different fields, because now Macron wants to do the citizen conventions, but one month ago he wanted to kill the Spitzen candidate in process, which is that every political family elects one candidate, which is an innovative process that we need to defend. So I would urge Mr. Macron, it's very good that he does that, but please defend all innovative participatory proposals everywhere. Mm -hmm. You live in close. So, do you think it's a good idea this uh, citizens' consultation? And are you going to take part in it? To discuss with citizens, I think it's not only a good idea, but it's absolutely necessary. It's vital because things are changing so fast that uh, also opinions change fast, also initiatives change fast, and we not only have to listen to the people, but we have to discuss with them in a way that uh, convinces each and every citizen in Eastern Europe or in Western Europe that their opinion will be valorized, that their opinion can have a weight in the future political decisions. I suppose the problem is, if you look at participation in European Parliament elections, it has been going down every single election since 1979. It's now at about 42 <laughs> percent. And surely one of the reasons for that is people feel, well, we can be consulted, but nothing changes. So what if at the end of this consultation, people say, OK, we want to reduce the size of the European Parliament or the expenditure of the European Parliament? Does anyone believe that will actually happen? Isn't that the problem? Is it's the expectation of any implementation, Joe? Now, good. Uh, we know from Eurobarometer, month by month, what are the priorities for the citizens. It's security nowadays. They want to have security in uh, various dimensions, physical security, social security. 
It's um, partly environmental questions. They want to have a good quality of life. Um, and uh, other, other issues, uh, what the people in their daily life uh, like to have. Of course, um, I mean, we are a representative uh, democracy that's written in the Lisbon Treaty. And decision makers have to uh, be accountable what uh, they take on board. And then the citizens have to vote next May and they can judge the parties whether they take their um, wishes on uh, their program or, or not. And the uh, citizens are the sovereign. Let, let's have a quick look at some of Emmanuel Macron's proposed reforms, because, of course, this discussion isn't just about the citizens' consultations, but his plans to overhaul the Eurozone and possibly to create a multi-speed Europe. At least that's one of the ideas that's been floated. Let's take a look at this report on Macron's day in Strasbourg on April the 17th. A vision of a reformed, deeply integrated Europe engaged with its own citizens and a redoubt against the dangers of nationalism and isolation. That was the vision that French President Emmanuel Macron laid out to European MPs in his first ever address to the EU Parliament in Strasbourg. I want to belong to a generation that defends European sovereignty because we fought to have it because there's a reason for it, and because it is the condition that will allow generations to come to decide their future for themselves. And I will not give in to any fascination with authoritarian sovereignty. Macron also outlined proposals for future EU projects, including the creation of a common Eurozone budget and finance minister, and financial aid for local authorities who welcome in and integrate refugees. Not everyone was so receptive to his ideas, though, particularly on the right wing. True democracy does not mean dividing us into good and bad Europeans. The vision of a European Union may be the right vision for France, but the ECR group feels it is not the right vision for all member states. The EU has seen much stress on its foundations in recent months, particularly with the United Kingdom gearing up to leave the bloc. Macron's speech, though, seemed designed to inject new life, putting the political union back at the heart of French policy. Uh, Julia Winkler, you uh, obviously uh, must be a bit worried about uh, the idea of Romania being sidelined if there's a core group in the middle of Europe that's going to be strengthened. Of, uh, of any central or eastern European country being sidelined, because uh, if we have a common project, then it means that we have to be at least equally or, 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 or uh, well, equally, yes, uh, enthusiastic about that project. Uh, when we uh, speak in uh, Eastern Europe about double standards, then we unfortunately have also uh, some reasons to, to say those words, so that, of course, the uh, project of President Macron is quite nice. Let's have a refoundation of Europe. And yes, we support the refoundation of Europe, but then the devil is always in the details. Two speeds, one speed, finance minister, who will elect it, uh, a, a parliament for the Eurozone? Uh, is this possible? Uh, what about the social dumping? Uh, I would contest even this term. I mean, do we have a common market or don't we have, a, do, we do not have a, a, a common market? And then if we have one and if we have the freedom of movement, movement then how can we speak about social dumping? So those are questions which, which are all in the detail, but they have to be sorted out. Is there a problem with Macron's idea leading to these multiple speeds. I um, wonder what, what either of you think about that. I know we are aware that with 27 member states probably next year, uh, not everybody can do everything at the same time. Mm. Important is, and I agree with my colleague, uh, the doors must be open. It uh, should not have closed shops mm. inside the union. Uh, that mm. would be against the spirit of having a community. But um, in the Eurozone, in the Schengen Zone, in the uh, defense cooperation, you have different uh, areas where not every country is ready to do it immediately. And um, uh, I hope we have to interpret Macron's ideas, not to create a closed shop, but to go ahead of those who want to go ahead. A closed shop is, is that tend, what you I should? tend to agree. I think we already have, in a way, a multiple speed Europe. We have members of the Eurozone, members outside Eurozone, members that are cooperating in the field of defense, members that are not on those projects. So we already have that. Most important thing is that every member state is able to participate in that if, they, if they're willing to. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I'm not that much afraid of that. But it's true, I wouldn't uh, follow the path of uh, dividing institutionally uh, the European institutions. Uh, 
uh, let me explain myself. I think that we can have members of the Eurozone and members that are not in the Eurozone but one single European Parliament that can deal with that. I mean, that for me, it's very clear. We don't need another, another chamber to deal with this. So we can keep the unity from an institutional point of level but have different ways of integration from a policy perspective. I think this is totally fine. And of course, I think the Eurozone needs an urgent reform. If for that urgent reform we need to have a kind of coalition of the willing, I think we, we, we just have to go uh, ahead with it. Well, is there a coalition of the willing? Because at the moment we're not even sure how far the German government is going to push through with Macron's ideas. Uh, what are you hearing from your SPD colleagues about that? Agreed. There is no free lunch in this world, so the new German government would not be willing to, let's say, give away money for purposes that are not uh, defined and uh, uh, where you have not uh, a clear-cut uh, objective for what the money is spent. Mm. But uh, we are willing to show more solidarity, to have an investment program in the Eurozone or in the EU, to take more money in, in uh, our hands in, in the EU. We are ready to create a European monetary fund, uh, that not the international monetary fund has to help European countries. Mm. It was meant for developing countries, but not for industrial countries. So I think uh, the door as well is opening uh, between France and Germany to come before summer this year uh, to a set of uh, ideas uh, that uh, are the next steps of European unity. Just one final area, because uh, you, you touched on this earlier, Ernest, about uh, Macron en marche and, you know, whether it can be somehow replicated across the board. Um, I'm just wondering what you three feel about um, whether there is any threat from Republic on the move here. Do you see such a, a political force taking shape in the European Parliament, or is it just impossible with the existing political families? What do you think about that? Uh, look, I don't think that any political movement can take shape in the European Parliament. Mm. They can gain representation in the European Parliament if the citizens validate such a movement. So uh, it's not so difficult for me to imagine uh, Romania on the move. <laughs> uh, which can be created maybe in some months, but it would be very difficult for me to say that it will be a successful political force. Because still, if you imagine and if you think about the responsibility of the governments in all the European Union member states, those responsibilities are usually shared by uh, uh, well-established parties. That is not to say that we don't need reform. We need reform. All EPP uh, uh, member parties, I cannot speak for SND, but probably it's uh, the same truth that we need some reforms. We need to open doors, as my colleague said. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But probably we cannot turn also in movements in all our countries yeah. to accompany President Macron. Let me put it like this. Um, I welcome any pro-European uh, political force because uh, next elections we will face a lot of nationalism, populism. So if we have a pro-European political force uh, adding to those we have already and secure that we have a solid majority to continue the European idea and the European project, I don't mind. Uh, nevertheless, we would be competitors uh, uh, with Macron in the election. Final words from you, Ernest. Do you see any kind of threat to any particular group here, perhaps the Liberals from Republic on the Move, or is it still very early days? I think it will happen, because Macron wants to do that. He will come with lots of MEPs, and I know that there are people that are ready to follow. Uh, and that's his project, and that's totally fine. Uh, the mm -hmm. problem is, behind this pro-European stance, there are also concrete proposals in different fields. It's a very liberal agenda, from my point of view. So mm -hmm. I think having a new pro-European uh, force here, that's totally fine. But of course, those of us who do not want to follow that liberal agenda will not be yeah. joining his, yeah. uh, his, his platform. So I think we, will, we will have his platform, like En Marche, like very pro-European with a liberal program, and we'll continue having, I guess, an S&D group, a Green group, and other groups yeah. in the parliament. We'll have to end it there. Thank you so much to my guests. And now it's time for our fact or fake segment with Yves Bertoncini, president of the European Movement in France and former head of the Jacques Delors Institute. The treaty on the functioning of the European Union forces member states to prohibit monopolies. It's what declared French author Thomas Guénolé in an interview to Figaro Vox in March 2018 before adding, these are the articles 101 to 110 of this treaty. It's easy to check. Then, let's check. These articles of the TFEU describe how the EU can fight 
abuses of dominant position and concerted practices between companies. Their objectives is to protect the consumers, the purchasing power and their range of choices. The consumers are often quite happy about it. It's in the same spirit that the Article 106 of the TFEU mentioned the undertakings entrusted with the operation of services of general economic interest or having the character of a revenue-producing monopoly. It provides that they shall be subject to the rules on competition in so far as the application of such rules does not obstruct the performance of the particular tasks assigned to them. This means that monopolies are possible within the framework of EU treaties. And indeed, these monopolies exist for the management of electricity, gas and railways infrastructures and in other sectors, not to forget all the non-economic services of general interest, such as education. Moreover, the Article 106 of TFEU is a copy-paste of the Article 90 of the Rome Treaty, which has not forbidden the existence of even more monopolies during decades. The European treaties are the outcome of an agreement between states. Their implementation is in the hands of these states, the European Parliament and the European Commission. Potential critics should be sent to these actors, not to the EU treaties. Well, that's it for the first part of the programme. Don't go away.